All right, cool. So thus begins the exam three review for the asynchronous class, Math 234. So let's check this thing out. Uh, up first, uh, going back to double integrals, uh, and just the very first way that we started by setting these up uh, was extending our idea about Riemann sums that we had back in Calc 1, where we added up a bunch of rectangles. Uh, we want to extend that into three dimensions, where we're going to add up a bunch of rectangular boxes in order to estimate some stuff, or rather estimate some volumes. So first problem we're going to look at, say we've got some function, uh, and D is the rectangular region will be determined by the inequalities. X is in between negative one and one. Y is in between two and four. Label these axes since we've got more than two variables these days. But choose a subdivision of D into squares with a side length of one. Use sample points of the Riemann sum at the top left corner of each square. Uh, so this particular example is going to ask us for the top left corner, uh, but you know an exam question might ask for a different corner of uh, of each one of these squares. So just make sure you you know you pay attention to which corner we're going to ask you for. Uh, but like I said, our particular one happens to be the top left corner. So I'll just sketch out a shape real quick. X goes from negative one to one, one two three four. Y is going to go from two to four. So our rectangular region, let's try that one more time. Hmm. Rectangular region should hopefully look something about like that. That's our region. This is D. Uh, from there, we wanted to subdivide this thing into more squares. Ah, oh, dang it. Uh, each with a side length of one. Uh, right now we have a two by two rectangle, so we'll split this up with just a couple more lines. Let's try it again. And then a line straight down the middle as well. Uh, so we have our four boxes. Box number, box number one, box number two, box number three, box number four. All right, those are our four squares. Uh, and in each one of these spots, we want to go to the upper left corner. So I'm going to need each of these points that I'm filling in. Right, so that each, uh, each upper left corner, uh, corresponding to the color of the label I gave to each rectangle. Uh, and we want to approximate the volume of that double integral. So we'd say over here probably that the volume is approximately equal to uh, the length times the width times uh, the height, where the height is going to be the function value of each of these rectangles. So this will be f of negative 1, 3 plus red. We've got f of 0, 2, or no, 0, 3. Uh, plus up next, f of, it looks like zero, four, plus lastly, f of negative one, four. All right, so each of those function values are our heights. Uh, we work that thing down. Uh, so each of these small regions are squares. So they each have a length and a width of one. So one times one times whatever we get when we plug those numbers in. Plugging in negative one and three, I get negative one times four. 
to be negative four. Uh, plus, uh, if I plug in zero for X, I'm gonna get just zero for the whole thing. I get that for the red and the green points. Uh, and then the point negative one, four, I get negative one times five, so negative five. Make that more clearly a negative sign, minus five. Also add up all of those numbers. Negative four minus five is negative nine, times one is still negative nine. So that'd be my approximate volume for this one, negative nine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, and let's take this down. Uh, up next, out of homework set 22, uh, is when we start looking at double integrals over general regions. Uh, we want to evaluate the current integral, which is doing x first and then y of the thing six times e to the three x squared. Oh, we wanna change our order of integration and then integrate this thing. So if we take a look at what we have so far, uh, trying to integrate e to the x squared would be kind of complicated uh, because we wouldn't have a good u substitution as it currently stands. Uh, so that means doing an x integral first is gonna be hard, uh, but doing a y integral of that base function uh, should be pretty easy since none of it depends on y. So we'll do a y integral first and hope that that'll make our x integral easier since changing the order of integration should not change the integrand or the thing that's on the inside of the integral, right? That part isn't gonna change just by changing the order uh, changing the order is just going to switch what the bounds are. Uh, so in order to actually figure out what that region should look like, it'll probably be good to sketch it out. Notice we're doing an x integral first. So we have the two equations, x equals 4y and x equals 4 being our left bound and our right bound. Since we're doing dx first, we're starting with x integrals, which means we move left to right. So the lower bound is the left-hand side and the upper bound is the right-hand side. So if we put these things on some coordinate axes, <laughs> sketch a couple of those pieces out real quick. Uh, we'd have the line x equals four. It's just a vertical line over here somewhere-ish. Uh, and the line x equals four y should hopefully be that one. So x equals four y and x equals four. Uh, from that, we know that uh, y is going to integrate from 0 to 1. Uh, so this must be 1 up there. This is 4 along here. Uh, and that shaded blue region on the interior of the triangle, uh, that's the region that we're going to try to integrate. So if we want to switch this thing around uh, so that we can change our order of integration. We're going to want to rewrite these equations for y equals instead of x equals. Uh, so instead of going from left to right, like we would if we're doing x integration first, we'll want to go bottom to top. Uh, so our bottom most function here is going to be y equals zero. So that's our, our lower function. <laughs> Uh, and if we switch that top equation around, x equals 4y should be the same thing as y equals 1 over 4x. 
So that's going to be step one. Our bounds for C and D, the lower bound is zero, the upper bound is one fourth X. Uh, then that just means we need to figure out what our X boundary should be. Uh, and our leftmost X value is zero and our rightmost X value is four. So if we're gonna switch our integration order around, uh, that should hopefully be our new bounds. Uh, so now we just have to go do that. Uh, so let's plug stuff in. <laughs> our double integral signs on here, zero to X over four. Uh, X was going from zero to four of six e to the three X squared, dy first, and then dx. Cool, so the advantage of integrating this thing with respect to y first is again, the, that y integral comes out pretty easy. It's just gonna be y times six e to the three x squared evaluated from zero to x over four. So this is from zero to four. We still have our three, or let's try that one more time. Six e to the three x squared times x over four minus zero. Dx. Dx, there it is. Okay, and then up next, uh, we're gonna wanna integrate that six e to the three x squared. Uh, so you can make yourselves a u substitution. U will be three to the x squared. So du is six x dx. We pretty much have that already. Uh, so this will be one over four times the integral of e to the u du. How it's been its new color. Uh, and the nice thing about all that uh, is that the integral of e to the u is just e to the u. So yeah, that'll be e to the u. That's what that thing integrates to. Uh, then we'll just want to substitute our stuff back in. Uh, u we know was three to the x squared. Uh, and we needed to evaluate x from zero to four. Uh, so plug all that stuff in, one over four times e to the 48, okay. three times 16 will be 48, minus e to the zero is one. Uh, and so that's what we would ultimately want to put up there in the box. So I'll just mark it with a star rather than trying to rewrite it again. Cool. Uh, so once again, to just kind of recap what we were doing here, uh, if we tried to integrate this thing in the order provided, which meant doing the X integral first, uh, we'd run into uh, something that we can't really integrate that well. Because again, trying to integrate E to the X squared isn't easy. But if we do the y integral first and then the x integral, we have a nice easy u substitution, uh, which is the motivating force behind changing our order of integration. It goes from something that is particularly difficult to integrate into something that we already know how to integrate. All right, cool, cool. Uh, another example of changing an order of integration. 
Uh, this time, we're just going to find the bounds without actually having to integrate the thing. So notice we aren't even told what the function is. It just says some f of x and y. I've got my coordinate bounds over here. I'm going to slide them to the right a little bit so I can put this all on the screen at once. And start looking at what we've got. Uh, this time we're doing a y integral first. Uh, so we should have two equations, y equals 75 and y equals 3x squared. So I'm going to start by graphing each of those pieces. Uh, the part on top being y equals y equals 75. And on the bottom, we have a parabolic shape. So let's see if I can see if I can sketch that through. Let's try it one more time. Mm, okay. Third time's the charm. Okay, I lied. Fourth time's going to be the charm. I'm taking this one regardless, so it better look nice. Yeah, good enough. Okay, so uh, we'll call that thing y equals 3x squared. Uh, then for our x boundaries, since we're doing that second, it's going to go from x equals 0 to x equals 5. So the line x equals 0. It's going to be this guy right here. That's our leftmost side out to x equals 5, uh, which we should hopefully find uh, is what we get if we set those two equations equal to each other. If x is 5, we get y equals 3 times 25, which is 75. So it, cool. That's right where those two, those two functions intersect with each other, meaning the region we're looking at is going to be just the right half of that of that parabola. So we don't want the left and the right half, which is what maybe the first set of intersecting graphs would suggest. Uh, we just want we just want the right half because again, uh, our x bounds are zero to five. So uh, what that means. Uh, is that if we want to switch this order of integration, meaning that we're going to do x first, uh, we need to rewrite our parabolic or quadratic equation uh, to be something that's x equals another thing. Um, so we already know that the parabola is y equals 3x squared. So if I solve that thing around, I should get that not y equals, but x equals plus or minus the square root of x of y over 3. Ugh. Apparently, I'm a little off my game today. On the other side, x equals the positive square root of x over 3. Maybe I'll move that into a more prominent position. All right. So negative square root is the part on the left. Positive square root is the part on the right. But again, we don't want the part on the left. We just want to go from x equals 0 out to x equals square root of y over 3. Dang it, I did it again. Get that out of there x equals the square root of y over 3. There we go. Square root of y over 3, with our lower bound for x being 0. Uh, and then our y bounds, minimum value is 0, maximum value is 75. Uh, 
uh, so again, that's all pretty much just going to be based on the picture. All right, yeah, up next. A question from chapter 15, section 10, that change variables nonsense, uh, where uh, mostly we're just going to be focusing on finding the Jacobian. Uh, what we'll say is that if we actually need to use the change of variables uh, is that a double integral over a region R that depends on X and Y as our variables. If we want to switch that over into a double integral involving U and V as our new set of variables, uh, it's something we can do. But if we're going to substitute u and v in for x and y, we're also going to need to substitute in something for du and dv uh, to make it be equal to dx times dy. Uh, and while you know just algebraic, the u and v substitution works just like it does in algebra, uh, changing those differentials, the derivative parts, uh, needs to describe actually how these things are changing through space. So in order to substitute dx and, or I'll try that one more time. In order to substitute du and dv in for dx and dy, we need to multiply by some kind of derivative factor. Uh, and that derivative factor is the Jacobian. Uh, and again, so that's just gonna let us throw some function in there that relates the differentials dx and dy to the differentials du and dv. And the way that works is it's just the determinant of the Jacobian matrix, which is the one spelled out in color. Uh, I'm just gonna take x and y and get its partial derivatives with respect to both u and v uh, and put them up into, uh, put them into that determinant form. So uh, if we're going to put this thing through, let's see what we've got. Uh, we want the Jacobian of the transformation, x equals uv, y equals u over v. Uh, and again, set up our Jacobian matrix. So up top, I want the derivative of x with respect to u, which is going to be v. Uh, then I'll want the derivative of x with respect to v, which is u, only moderately confusing. I go through that second line down. I want the derivative of y with respect to u. Since y is u over v, that derivative is 1 over v. Uh, and then I want the partial of y with respect to v. Uh, should be negative u over v squared. And after we set up that particular matrix, uh, we are going to need the determinant of j, is what actually goes in here. The determinant of that Jacobian matrix is usually the thing that we care about. Uh, so if we put that, let's try it one more time, put that into some amount of perspective. Uh, yeah, take that determinant V times negative U over V squared. It's gonna be negative U over V. Oh, let's actually just write it out. Negative U times u times v times negative u over v squared minus u times 1 over v. Uh, which is the absolute value of negative 2 over 2u two over v. which we'd probably still say is the absolute value of 2u over v. Right, so it's, it is important uh, that when we plug this thing into the integration formula, we take the absolute value of that determinant.
Uh, and since u and v are variables, we'll need to keep that absolute value sign there until we know what the, uh, the actual bounds for our, for our variables are. Let me go to the chat real quick. All right, uh, uh, next, finding the Jacobian of another transformation. Uh, we've got e to the 2s minus t, and y is e to the s plus 2t. Uh, so, so we zoom in here a little bit. Hopefully get that part down. So the derivative of x, I think we said we'd order these all alphabetically. So S comes before T, so that'll be our first derivative. E to the 2S minus T times two. And E to the 2S minus T times negative one. Uh, onto the Y partials. Uh, this will be e to the s plus 2t times 1 and e to the s plus 2t times 2. And then once again, if we needed the, to actually do some integration with this Jacobian, uh, we'd find the, the absolute value of the determinant. All right, and one last example where we go into 3D. So we'll throw a Z variable in there too, but it should hopefully just work the same way. Uh, our change of variables is going to go to U, V, and W. So it should be the U derivatives first, then the V derivatives, then the W derivatives. If I go column, 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 first column, so all the U derivatives. Um, the first row is going to be the partial derivatives of x. So x partial u is 0, x partial v is 2v, and x partial w is 1. Same thing for y. y partial u is 1, y partial v is 0, y partial w is 2w. And then on to z. What? u squared plus v, z partial u is 2u, z partial v is 1, and z partial w is 0. Right on. Okay. Moving on to polar coordinates. What if I saved any of this part? Looks like I saved at least a little. Uh, so first thing out of polar coordinates that we should hopefully remember, uh, if we're going to change dA into polar coordinates, uh, then dA should be r times dr d theta. Uh, and if you've uh, seen some of the lecture videos, you probably know that that r is kind of attached to the d theta term, uh, but that isn't super important. Again, dA, the differential in polar coordinates should become r times dr d theta, uh, where as long as we're back in polar coordinates and finding the volume bounded by the two paraboloids, given there is z, uh, if it's in polar coordinates, then our height is the integrand. So the thing that we're actually integrating should be the, the height or the, the distance between those two functions. Uh, but we've also looked ahead into uh, triple integrals. So this problem also could be done with the triple integral instead of with the double integral, since we're just looking for volume. Uh, so hopefully we'll see as we go through this process that uh, the triple integral, if we just do the z integral part first, uh, would end up looking just like the double integral we're about to do. 
I don't know, but maybe more on that later. So up first, what are we interested in? We've got our two equations for Z. Uh, this one and a, this one, probably call it Z1 and Z2. Z1 and Z2, uh, where Z2 is on top, Z1 is on bottom. Notice that Z2 is a para, it's an elliptical paraboloid. I suppose we'll start by saying that first, uh, but it starts off at a height of 16 and then opens down. Uh, whereas Z1 is also an elliptical paraboloid, but it starts at a height of zero and then opens up. Uh, which means uh, we're probably going to care about the intersection between these two paraboloids. So let's just do that. Take Z1, set it equal to Z2. Uh, and we'll get 2x squared plus 2y squared equals 16 minus 2x squared minus 2y squared. Uh, add everything over to, or well, let's gather up all our like terms on one side. 4x squared plus 4y squared is 16. Uh, and that should be our height. Uh, so over here on the right, uh, the thing that we're actually going to want to integrate, just z2 minus z1. So I guess it's not technically the, the height, because I set them equal to each other to find their intersection. The thing that I want to integrate is just the difference between them. So I guess I misspoke there slightly. Uh, and that thing should just be 16 minus 4x squared minus 4y squared, or 16 minus 4r squared. And that'll be multiplied by r dr d theta. So don't forget about that, uh, that extra factor of r that goes into the integration in polar coordinates. Uh, but... Uh, coming back to the part where we set these two things equal to each other, uh, the thing we're looking for here uh, is the projection of these two shapes into the xy plane. Or perhaps stating it slightly more simply than that, um, if I look at where these two paraboloids are going to intersect with each other, I get a circle of radius 2. Uh, which is the region sketched out below. Uh, and so if that's going to be my region, uh, then I should have bounds for r and for theta. Uh, I want the entire region uh, that's inside that circle. So r should go from 0 out to 2. Uh, and I'm going to want to go all the way around the circle, right? There's nothing that I want to exclude here. So theta will just be its default of 0 to 2 pi. Uh, the only reason I'd want to have different bounds for theta is if I was only taking the top half of the circle, only taking the right half of the circle, or if there were some reason why I wanted to exclude some part of the circle. If I were just like cutting out a wedge of this or some slice of the circle, I'd change theta around accordingly. Oh, but this one doesn't have anything like that. Uh, so, and what button did I hit? Oh boy. Wow, oh, switched over to exam two. Uh, so we'll just use zero to two pi for theta. All right, uh, filling in the other pieces, theta is here, r is here, 0 to 2. Uh, 
Oh, yeah, right. So f of x and y should be again z2 minus z1. Uh, so that is 16 minus 2x squared minus 2y squared minus 2x squared plus 2y squared. So 16 minus 4x squared minus 4y squared. Or 16 minus 4 times x squared plus y squared which means if I change that over to r and theta, we're just looking at 16 minus four r squared. I'd be a bit more explicit about where I was getting that from earlier. Uh, so let's actually compute that double integral. Zero to two pi, zero to two of sixteen r minus four r cubed dr d theta. All right, uh, going to the chat real quick before I move on. Can I explain once more why that is the function we are integrating? Yes. So uh, in, when we were doing when we were doing volume in the double integral section of the chapter, uh, we said that and this is when we're specifically focusing on there being some height that we want to be integrating over. Uh, the double integral by itself should give us a kind of area. Uh, so we just want to integrate whatever our height is. So they can do the double integral of the height function. Uh, and here, if we think about the 3D shape, uh, which is two paraboloids that are intersecting with each other, um, I suppose that's going to end up being a sort of egg looking shape. Uh, if I can do my best to describe a 3D shape in words, it's going to look like an egg. Um, and the height at any one point over the region. So like think about uh, think about this region over here. Uh, the circle x squared plus y squared equals four. Uh, the height of our egg <laughs> over that region that's in the x y plane is just going to be the top of the egg minus the bottom of the egg. Should get us the height that goes through the through the center of that egg. Uh, if we're right through the very center, I think our height's going to be at a maximum. It's going to be the full 16 whatever. Uh, but if we're slightly off center, then the floor of our egg doesn't quite touch the ground. The top of our egg wouldn't get all the way up to like the top at 16. Uh, so again, that height should just be the distance between the top eggshell and the bottom eggshell. Hopefully that crazy explanation makes some amount of sense and isn't just the ramblings of a madman on a Sunday night. But all right, cool. Glad that worked. Uh, if you're watching this later and wondering what the heck I'm talking about, uh, shout me out on Piazza, I guess. I'll probably answer, or at least try to. Ah, but moving on, uh, we need to integrate this thing. Uh, notice that it's a separable integral. Uh, because, well, because there really isn't the theta on there. But I can factor all of my thetas out from all of my r's, uh, meaning I can just do an integral for theta. Watch out. This will be just d theta from 0 to 2 pi. Times just an r integral that goes from 0 to 2, 16r minus 4r cubed dr.
Uh, so this will be two pi. Uh, times whatever we get when we integrate that thing. Uh, it looks like 8r squared minus r to the fourth. Plugging in two, we should get eight times four minus two to the fourth, which is 16. Uh, so what do we get when we do all that up? Uh, eight times four is 32 minus 16 is 16. 16 times two pi, 32 pi. Uh, hopefully you get the same. All right, cool. This one I thought ahead on. Uh, since trying to sketch out a 3D shape takes some time, uh, so I did my best to sketch it out ahead. Uh, so we just kind of talk about what sort of crazy looking shape we've got here. Because uh, we're going to try to change this triple integral uh, into three different permutations of the order. Uh, so this one, to go to a triple integral, if we have dx, dy, and dz, there are six possible combinations or six possible orders we can have to get this thing done in. Uh, and on the exam, probably only going to ask you to change it once. Uh, but at least for the review, we'll change it. We'll, we'll have it set up three different times. So we can kind of hopefully start to see some of the nuances uh, between each of those, each case. So what is it we've got? Uh, we have some region E is going to be bounded by a couple of surfaces. Uh, one of those is a parabolic Nope, try again. An elliptical paraboloid. There we go. Just put ellipse and parabola together and someone will hopefully know what you're talking about. Uh, and the plane y equals zero. So if we start trying to generate a thought about what that elliptical paraboloid is going to look like. Uh, so we notice that it's got two square terms. The square terms have the same sign, which means it's elliptical rather than hyperbolic. Uh, it'd be hyperbolic if x squared and z squared had opposite signs. We know it's got some kind of a parabolic shape because there's one linear term with a couple of square terms. Uh, and if we think about this thing more like a parabola, I've got y equals 36 minus square numbers. So maybe this is like 36 minus u squared or something where u can, or u squared can just represent uh, the ellipse that I know I've got going on. So 36 minus u squared, that's a parabola that opens down, or since it's y equals 36 minus u squared, that's a parabola that opens left. Uh, it should have a vertex at 36 and a, you know, u or x, z, y, whatever, a u value of zero. Uh, so it'll be right along the y-axis. It's got a maximum point at 36. Uh, and then from 36, this thing should open up to the left, uh, which is why I get my point uh, right here. That's going to be at a y value of 36. Uh, and then the whole thing opens left. Uh, and then it's going to stop uh, when it hits the plane y equals zero. Uh, and don't forget, if my plane is y equals zero, that means I'm really talking about the x, z plane. Uh, since, yeah, that's the plane where y is zero. So I suppose I've got my colors a little backwards up here. Uh, because really, it's that elliptical paraboloid is the shape that I've colored in yellow, while the plane y equals zero, uh, that contains the ellipse that I put in magenta. 
So if y is zero, I've got zero equals 36 minus four x squared minus nine z squared. Uh, so that ellipse should really be four uh, x squared plus nine z squared equals 36. Again, just plug in zero for y and then put that equation into a form that we can recognize. Now, uh, hopefully we can recognize that thing as an ellipse. Uh, just sort of looking at um, its semi-major and semi-minor axes. If I look at, you know, let x be zero for a second, we'll look at the z-axis. So again, if x is zero, I get nine z squared equals 36, meaning z squared is four. Uh, so z is gonna go from negative two to two. I'm just looking at the z values there. Same thing for the x values. This time I'm gonna let z be equal to zero and just look at a maximum and minimum x value. Uh, so four x squared equals 36. 36 over four is nine. So x must go from negative three to three. Uh, and then if I just kind of shade this thing in, no, no, shade this thing in the same way I did in the 3D shape on the left, I put some uh, some gray slash lines through the middle. So the, the shape that we're looking at on the right, the 2D ellipse is the same ellipse that you can see sketched out uh, in the 3D shape on the left. Hopefully there's some amount of clarity uh, in, in those shapes. I know that uh, sketching out 3D shapes can be pretty difficult. Uh, but I have every confidence uh, that you guys will be able to figure it out. I believe in you. Yeah. <laughs> okay, uh, enough of me rambling on. Let's actually take a look at what it is we're trying to do. Since we have, and at least we now have an idea of what our 3D shape looks like. So step one uh, is asking us to uh, do a specific order for our integration over here. Uh, it's wanting us to go uh, y first, then z, then x. So if we're gonna do y first over here, which is what that first thing is going to ask us to do. Fortunately, I think y first is going to be the easy one because we already have both of our two surfaces uh, expressed as a y equals something. Uh, since we're doing y first, we should do our left bound is the bottom and our right bound is the top. So our left bound ought to be zero while our right bound is 36 minus 4x squared minus 9z squared. Wait, that was, uh, that is sort of what, or that is exactly what we were given as our initial setup. y equals 0, y equals 36 minus 4x squared minus 9z squared. So now that we have that thing out of the way, we did a y integral first, which means that we're going to want to project this three-dimensional shape into the y equals zero plane. Or let's try that one more time. We want to project this shape into the x, z plane. Since again, we got rid of y, we want to project it into the plane that doesn't have y in it anymore, because we want to integrate over y first. So as it turns out, that is that uh, magenta ellipse that we already sketched out. Uh, and we've done a fair bit of the heavy lifting for ourselves already. Uh, we know that x, which is last, is gonna go from negative three to three because uh, we, want, we want the entire ellipse. There's nothing that we're cutting out this time. Uh, so the x part also, you know, well, usually the last one you do is pretty easy. 
because we know that the last one done just needs to be between two numbers. Uh, so I need to express my ellipse in terms of a couple of Z equations. Uh, which if we rearrange this thing for Z, we should hopefully get Z squared is equal to uh, 36 minus 4x squared over 9. Uh, so z, don't forget if you take the square root of a variable, you should end up with a plus or minus. You know, the square root of 36 minus 4x squared all over 3. I'll simplify that a little bit uh, and give ourselves a, you know, take the square root of nine because it's just by itself in the denominator. So the positive square root should be the top half, negative square root should be the bottom half. Uh, so let's go pop those bounds in over here. Negative square root 36 minus four x squared over three and positive square root 36 minus 4x squared over 3. Cool, so that's just step one. Hip hip hooray. So let's scroll this thing down to part two. Again, on the actual exam, we're only gonna ask you to do this once, uh, but for the sake of kind of expressing everything that we're doing here, I'm gonna look at it at least three times. So part two is asking us to go Z first, then Y, then X. So if I wanted to do this thing for z first, uh, I'd want to take that initial equation, uh, y equals 36 minus 4x squared minus 9z squared, and just rearrange it for z. So uh, this will be 9z squared is equal to 36 minus 4x squared minus y. All right, if I just rearrange the, the y, that initial equation I had for y. And since this is z, I'm just gonna need a top and a bottom. Uh, so, so let's do that. Uh, divide the nine over, take some square roots of a3, which is the bottom, should be the negative square root of 36 minus 4x squared minus y, all over 3. Um, and b3 should just be the positive of that, 36 minus 4x squared minus y all over three. Uh, it's getting to be quite a bit to write down, so I'm just gonna mark that off with a couple of dots. Put the magenta dots, or the magenta equations into the magenta dots. Cool, so again, we wanted to split this thing up so that we could do a Z integral first. So there's some sort of bottom surface and some sort of top surface. Uh, which are expressed by those two equations. Uh, and since we did the z integral first, I want to project that 3D shape. Again, same 3D shape because we haven't changed our region. I want to project that into the xy plane uh, because I wanted to eliminate the z variable. So projecting this thing into the xy plane should hopefully still have a 36 up here. And this thing just looks like a parabola in the x in the xy plane. So 
So y is going to be my vertical axis, x will be my horizontal axis. And I'll just take it back to the classics uh, for x and y, regular 2D stuff. Uh, and I already know uh, from the ellipse that I sketched above uh, that these x values should be 3 and negative 3. Sort of based on the way I was shading that in above. Uh, this ought to be what our shape looks like. And if I look at a top equation and a bottom equation here, uh, in the plane where z is equal to 0, this guy is just y equals 36 minus 4x squared. would be the equation of the parabola. And the lower bound, the horizontal line y equals 0, or the x-axis. So if we put that into our bounds equations, y was second, lower bound of 0, upper bound of 36 minus 4x squared. Uh, and our x values, negative 3 to 3. And if we take a peek at the last example, so it says do x first, then z, then y. Uh, so let's go ahead and do that. Uh, this time we'll take the same starting equation, y equals 36 minus 4x squared minus 9z squared. <coughs> but this time, solve it for x. 4x squared equals 36 minus 9z squared minus y. Just the piece I need to solve for first. Uh, so taking that equation, but solving it for x first this time, a3 should be x equals the square root of 36 minus 9 z squared minus y. Put the hat on our square root, divided by the square root of 4, which is 2. And this is the lower bound, so it should be the negative square root. As opposed to the upper bound, which is going to look pretty much the same, except it's the positive square root instead of the negative square root. And I'll just use a couple of dots to help me out here. Uh, so we did x first. So I want to project this thing into the plane that doesn't have x into it. So project it into the yz plane, which will be this one over here. We we'll use the 3D setup. So I'll keep z as the vertical axis, y will be my horizontal axis. Uh, and take a look at what this shape's going to look like. And I can still put a 36 out here on that y-axis. And I think this is probably the shape that we have if we're trying to project it again into the yz plane. I can use that magenta line to kind of highlight where that magenta ellipse was from the very first diagram. Uh, what is it that we need? I think we said we're doing z second. Yeah, we did say we're doing z second. Uh, so I'll need to express this thing as a top curve and a bottom curve. 
uh, which if y is, or nope, sorry, if x is zero, then I should have z2 equals the square root of 36 minus y over three, and z1 is negative square root 36 minus y over three. Uh, and then just call these things what, or well, I'll worry about that part later. Uh, finally, uh, y should go from zero out to 36. Uh, because again, I just have only have positive values for y. So bring that back over here, zero, oops, zero to 36. Uh, and I'll use those magenta dots uh, for the Z bounds again. If I zoom out a bit and kind of try to put all of this into perspective. Uh, here's all three of our pictures. Uh, so in the end, I ended up taking my three-dimensional region uh, and projecting it into each of the, uh, what is that, the, into each of the x, y, x, z, and y, z planes. I guess it was x, z first, then x, y, then y, z. Uh, a couple more bounds that probably I should have put on here. This was three, this was negative three. Ooh, wait, no, let's try that one more time. Two and negative two. Three and negative three was X. Z wasn't quite as tall. Also looks like I maybe should have shrunk that last graph down a little bit if I was trying to keep it to scale, but oh well. It's the thought that counts, right? Hopefully. <laughs> All right. Let's scroll that into our next one. Uh, so uh, to actually solve out a triple integral, uh, yeah, let's just do one. Integrate three x, y, z, but we're gonna do it three times. So zero to one, two x to three x, and zero to four y, three x, y, z, dz, dy, dx. So if we do that first part, uh, what is it we're gonna be looking at? Uh, three over two x, y, z squared. Doing that from zero to four y, dy dx, keep our bounds in here, zero, one, two x, three x. Yeah. Uh, if we actually plug that bit in, oop, I think I left off a four y up here, didn't I? Uh, integrating z squared. Uh, from zero to four y, uh, so that'll be 16 y squared. Uh, so 24 x y squared times y, y cubed, dy and then dx. 
dy goes from 2x to 3x, x from 0 to 1. Uh, so what do we get next? Integral 0 to 1, 24 over 4 times x, y to the fourth. Integrating this guy from 2x up to 3x. Still with the x in there. Uh, so this thing will be the integral of uh, 24 over 4 is 6. That's going to be an x to the fourth both times, multiply by x to the x to the fifth. Or you know what? I'm just going to need one extra bar here. Let's not do too many steps at once. We get 81 x to the fourth minus 16 x to the fourth. Write that all the way out. Hopefully I don't make any mistakes when I do that. Uh, so what's this thing look like? Uh, we have integral of six times x to the fifth times 81 minus 16. Pretty sure that's 65. <laughs> dx, x goes from 0 to 1. Uh, and then this integral is not so bad. Uh, x to the fifth integrates to x to the six over 6. So that factor of 6 cancels out. Uh, the only thing that's still there is 65. By the time I plug in 0 and 1. Cool. So probably at least one problem on the exam where we ask you to do a somewhat simple triple integral. Same thing here, scoot that thing down. <coughs> what do we have next? Uh, looking for the volume of the solid enclosed by a cup by the cone and the sphere. Now with a triple integral in cylindrical coordinates. Yeah, sure. Seems like that'll work. Uh, so if we think about what this thing's going to look like, uh, I think it's going to look kind of like an ice cream cone. If you'll let me use that particular expression what it'll look like we have a a cone with the point at the origin and it gets opens up as you move up the z-axis so you know think about holding an ice cream cone the way that a rational person that's seen an ice cream cone before would hold an ice cream cone uh, and then put a single scoop of ice cream on the top nice perfectly round spherical scoop of ice cream on the top of this cone uh, and that's the shape we're looking at uh, so again, yep, it's a it's a cone and a sphere. Right ho. Uh, so let's give this thing a shot. Uh, if we look at this first equation, we'll call it z1 because it's going to be our cone, which is on the bottom. Uh, we get z1 equals r. I want it, yeah, we'll do it that way. Uh, on to that next bit. I have this thing called Z2. Uh, and Z2 should look like the equation R squared plus Z squared equals eight. So we've changed our two equations into 
cylindrical coordinates. Uh, and the last bit we should do uh, is talk about what it is that we actually want to integrate. We're just looking for the volume of this thing. So we only want to be integrating dv. Uh, but don't forget that in cylindrical coordinates, uh, the volume differential dv is r times dz dr d theta. So there's that extra factor of r because we're in cylindrical coordinates. Uh, so what do we need next? <coughs> um, well, I suppose we can start by just expressing what z1 and z2 are equal to. Uh, Z1, we already know, is just going to be R, because that's our cone. That's the piece that's on the bottom. Up top, we want that uh, the top half of the ice cream scoop, which means we only want the top half of uh, the top half of our sphere. Uh, so if we solve that equation for Z, you know, Z squared is equal to 8 minus R squared. So Z is plus or minus the square root of 8 minus R squared. Uh, but again, we only need the top half. So I'm going to call that 8 minus r squared. Get that over again from z2. Uh, I won't be needing the bottom half of my sphere because uh, it's, well, it would go below the cone. Uh, what else? Uh, next, we need to know what values to use for r which means we're going to care about the intersection of z1 and z2. Uh, so if that's the case, I want to set z1 equal to z2, uh, which means I'm going to be substituting in r for z. Uh, so this should be the equation r squared plus r squared is equal to 8. So 2r squared is 4, meaning r... Ooh, wait, <laughs> did too many steps in my head there. 2r squared equals 8, meaning r squared equals 4. There it is. Uh, so if r squared equals 4 is our intersection of the cone and the sphere, r itself should bounce between 0 and 2. So 0 to 2 are my bounds on that. And I want the full circle. So once again, I'll just have theta doing its default 0 to 2 pi. All right, here's where, was I smart enough to keep all that work? Nope. That's OK. Well, let's just do this thing. Triple integral. And work. Try and keep them all somewhat organized. Uh, we are integrating r times dz was first, then dr, and then d theta. Theta is from 0 to 2 pi. r is from 0 to 2. And z is from r to the square root of 8 minus r squared. All right, let's see if I can do this somewhat quick. Uh, notice that for this one, the z integral is going to depend on r, so it's not completely separable. Uh, so I'm just going to have to do the z integral first. I can't just like split it up and do 1 times the second times the third because uh, they're going to depend on each other. Uh, so this thing becomes the integral from 0 to 2 pi uh, times the integral from 0 to 2 of r times 
the square root of eight minus r squared minus r times r, so r squared uh, dr d theta. But this time I can separate things. Uh, after plugging in what I got for z, this then becomes a separable equation for r and theta. So I can pull theta out, I can pull r out, and just kind of integrate them separately. Uh, the theta integral is just going to be 2 pi, uh, since I'm integrating d theta from 0 to 2 pi. Uh, the r integral, I think, is going to be a bit more of a mess. I mean, like, I know it's going to be a bit more of a mess. Uh, when I did that thing, let's see what I got. I got negative one half times eight minus r squared to the three halves. Right, let me just pull off a quick u substitution on that first guy. Second piece, way nicer to integrate, r cubed over three. This thing needs to be evaluated from zero to two. Uh, if we do that, we will get still two pi. That part hasn't changed. What does this look like? Negative one half times eight minus four is four to the three halves minus two cubed is eight over three minus a negative one half. times eight to the three halves. Minus zero. Uh, and does this thing simplify? Probably it simplifies a little. Yeah. Not like a whole lot though. Uh, I ended up getting two pi times, well, let's call it two pi over three uh, times eight to the three halves minus 16. Hmm. Hang on one second. There should have been a times two thirds right here for the the integral of the of the square root. Right. This thing simplified to a one third right there. Negative one half times two thirds is negative one third. There we go. Read my work a little too quickly. Maybe something looked a bit off, but anyway, that's what I got after simplifying it a bit. Uh, I don't think the one that we asked on the exam requires 
as much simplification as this. I think the, the integration part is quite a bit easier on the actual exam question, I think. Okay. Yeah, and then it was the next couple. I just kind of left the work already done up. Uh, so I'll just kind of walk our way through the second one. Uh, so we want to take another integral. This time it's already set up for us. Uh, we don't need to. We don't need to do the setup part. Just evaluate it. Or oh, well, that's not totally true. Uh, it is still in rectangular coordinates to start, uh, but then we're going to change it into our cylindrical coordinates and go from there. Uh, one of the most important parts on this one, though, is going to be right over here. Uh, if we you know, take a look at the order of integration we're doing, it says do z first, then y, then x. Cool, so we can do the z integration part. That's not too bad. x squared plus y squared is r squared. So it's zero to 25 minus r squared, that part's all fine. It's the next region uh, that I'm particularly going to care about. Uh, leaving, hopefully that thing's still drawn up over on the left. Uh, the y bounds are y equals zero up to y equals the positive square root of 25 minus x squared. So that means our lower bound is the x-axis, our upper bound is the top half of the circle. X squared plus y squared is 25. So top half of the circle with radius of five centered at the origin. Uh, but I only want the top half of that circle, right? So I know that, you know, my bounds, I'm looking at x squared plus y squared is 25. Cool, again, circle centered at the origin. It's got a radius of five, uh, but I only want the top half of the circle meaning I only want the first two quadrants of that circle, quadrant one and quadrant two, uh, going to the unit circle. Uh, that means that my angle theta should only go between zero and pi. Since if I left it as the default zero to two pi, that would take the whole circle, which would get both the top and the bottom half, and I didn't want that. I only wanted the top half. Top half is the angles from zero to pi, bottom half of the circle would be the angles from pi to two pi. A couple other questions we could ask about this. Uh, if all I wanted was the first quadrant, it would look something like this. Zero to the square root for y, zero to five for x right, because then I'd be limiting the top half and the right half would be only the first quadrant. So theta should only do zero to pi over two. Uh, if I had reversed the order so that it was X and then Y and say that, you know, X went from maybe negative square root up to zero, probably is what it might look like. That would be just the left half of the of the circle which would be an angle of pi over two to three pi over two uh, but again to to really get the bounds on this one you'll want to sketch the shape that you have and then go to the unit circle to decide what angles you're going to want top half though is usually the easiest thing to ask so that's probably the one that we're going to throw at you and if all i want is the top half of the circle zero to pi for theta But with the other pieces, yeah, R is going to go from zero to five from the origin out to the edge of the circle. Theta, again, we just talked about zero to pi. Uh, and then do that integral out. Here's all my work. I paired it down to 5,000 pi times five thirds minus one third, five thirds minus one which I suppose means I really could have simplified this one more time uh, and called it uh, what, five thirds minus one is two thirds. Uh, it's 10,000 pi over three. 
No, uh, but that the last bit feels a bit unnecessary. Again, the real trick to this problem is making sure that you only take the top half of the circle. All right, and then on to 27, or homework 27, which is spherical integration, uh, another volume problem. Uh, expressing the volume of the sphere, x squared plus y squared plus z squared equals 25. Uh, and it's going to be in between the cones, z equals square root of 3x squared plus 3y squared, and z equals the square root of x squared plus y squared over 3. So one of the equations that's particularly helpful here is that tangent of phi Yeah, it's tangent to phi is equal to r over z. Uh, where r is the r value that we use from cylindrical coordinates. It's the same r from uh, that we would use from polar coordinates, not rho, which is the three-dimensional radius we use in spherical coordinates. Uh, if I'm wanting this equation here, tangent phi is equal to r over z. Uh, it's an equation that helps us to relate cylindrical coordinates to spherical coordinates. Uh, there is a corresponding equation in rectangular coordinates. It's just tangent phi equals the square root of x squared plus y squared all over z. That one I think is a little bit messier to remember. This one's nice and concise. Uh, and it, I think it, Thinking about it this way, it's easier to visualize what it is that we're actually looking at here. Uh, so if phi is the angle measured from the positive z axis, then z is going to be the adjacent side, because z is always going to be adjacent to, um, to that angle. The hypotenuse would be rho, the three-dimensional radius, goes from the origin out to wherever our point is, uh, which then makes the opposite side uh, the length that connects the z-axis straight out to our point, right out to the edge of rho. Uh, so the opposite side is r, the adjacent side is z, e, tangent of phi is r over z. Uh, that equation is super, super helpful when trying to simplify these two cones, uh, because otherwise you need to do like, you know, we could plug in x, y, and z are equal to like, rho sine phi cosine theta and rho sine phi sine theta and rho cosine phi are the three x, y, and z's. Plug them all in, do a couple Pythagorean identities, simplify some stuff to one, pull things out of a square root, and you can ultimately get yourself down to tangent to phi equals one over the square root of three, or you can skip all that noise uh, and just simplify that first equation to r over z equals 1 over the square root of 3. Simplifying the right equation, to r over z equals just the square root of 3. And then making the substitution for tangent phi. Uh, so it's super helpful if you remember that particular transformation. Uh, because it's going to make solving this style of problem way, way easier than trying to do all that trig substitution. But if you know you really want to do the trig sub, more power to you, I suppose. I wouldn't do it if it were me. I would do it this way. That's why I did it this way. Uh, anywho, uh, going to the unit circle, uh, if tangent phi is equal to the square root of 3, or if tangent phi equals 1 over square root of 3, those are both angles we know from the unit circle, uh, specifically tangent of pi over 6 is equal to 1 over square root 3, or if it's rationalized, that's root 3 over 3. Uh, and the tangent of pi over 3 is equal to the square root of 3. So solving each of those things for phi means that I have two angles for phi that I want to integrate in between. Uh, we're also looking for the volume of the sphere that's in between those two cones. 
Uh, so we're going to go ahead and use uh, rho going all the way from 0 to 5 and theta from 0 to 2 pi. Is that right? Yeah, because it's rho. It's not r. Yep, rho goes all the way out to the edge. So rho will go from 0 to 5. Uh, notice that like if we're just looking at r, the you know polar coordinate radius, that one doesn't go 0 to 5, but it's fine. We're not looking at r, we're looking at rho. Uh, rho goes from 0 to 5, theta goes from 0 to 2 pi, because I want to go all the way around, and I want to go from the origin all the way out to the edge of the sphere. Uh, and that thing ends up looking like this. Uh, where, once again, uh, pretty much everything in here is separable. Uh, so separate each piece out into a theta, a phi, and a row integral. I can get numbers for each, multiply them all together, and I got the answer that's there on the right. 5 cubed times pi over 3 times root 3 minus 1. Hopefully my math is right on that one. Oh, yeah. And then finally, one last set of things I want to talk about. Uh, just identifying some shapes uh, from homework nine. Uh, the exam doesn't focus too much or hardly any on homework nine because it's mostly about applying homework nine uh, into cylindrical and spherical integration. Uh, but sometimes knowing a couple basic shapes can help us out. Uh, so if we look through uh, some of these things real quick, if we have the surface uh, phi equals pi over 2, uh, this thing should probably be described as a plane. Uh, specifically, this is going to be the xy plane. Right, phi is uh, phi is pi over two. That means the same thing as phi is equal to ninety degrees. Uh, measure a right angle away from the z-axis, and you're going to end up in the x-y plane. Uh, no matter no matter where you're measuring that angle from, as long as it's from the z-axis down. Uh, so, anytime we've got phi equals an angle, that's going to be some kind of plane. We just happen to get a particularly nice a particularly easy one to describe in this example. Uh, the surface, rho equals 2, is a sphere. This one also usually doesn't need too much explanation. Uh, it's the sphere of radius 2 centered at the origin. The next two we're going to look at tends to be a bit funkier. Um, so if I've got rho equals 5 sine theta times sine phi, this is going to be a sphere again. I want to tell you that ahead of time, so as I sort of describe what the shape will look like, uh, you can start to see it. Uh, so if I'm looking at sine theta sine phi, uh, that looks pretty much like rho squared equals y. I know it's like the, the sine theta times sine phi should remind you of y, because y is rho sine theta sine phi. Uh, which means that this is going to end up being a sphere that has a radius of 5 over 2. Uh, and its center will be on the y-axis. Just kind of by looking at it. Uh, if we were to try to sketch that thing out, Uh, let's just take a look at the positive y, z plane, uh, which means that this is the plane where theta is equal to pi over 2. I'm actually going to maybe just slide this thing up a little bit. And I start trying to sketch out what our shape is going to look like. Uh, 
at an ang if phi is at an angle of zero, I'm going to be at the origin uh, because sine of zero is zero. Uh, if I'm at an angle of pi over two, uh, phi is sine phi is equal to one. So I should be out here at five. I should label some of these points. This is phi equals pi over two. If I pick something in the middle, like say pi over four, so b phi equals pi over four is that line, uh, and sine of uh, sine of phi is root two over two. I'll end up at this point if I also sketch out the line of phi equals. Oops. I forgot pi's hat. Phi equals three pi over four. I'm gonna have a point that's right here. And if I track that through space, I get that circle. Uh, and if I kind of rotate that thing around into rotate through theta, uh, so I start including some values of x. Uh, I'll start to see, um, what is it? I'll start to see that that thing comes out to a sphere. <clears throat> uh, quite similarly, this shape down here is also a sphere. Uh, it has a radius of four. 8 over 2, which is 4. This one's going to have a center on the z-axis. Since just uh, cosine phi, should hopefully remind you of z. Uh, but if I actually sketch out why this thing looks like that and relate it back to rectangular coordinates, uh, it might, might be easy to understand that way. So I've got rho equals 8 cosine phi. And I'm going to take this entire thing and multiply it by rho, uh, giving me rho squared equals 8 rho cosine phi. Uh, switching this thing back to rectangular coordinates, x squared plus y squared plus z squared is equal to 8 z. Uh, since rho cosine phi is going to be z, let's give ourselves a bit more space. I could just call this thing good as it is and plug it in, but I want it to be in a form I recognize a bit better. Uh, so x squared plus y squared plus z squared minus 8z equals zero. Uh, and I'm going to be interested in completing the square to get this thing into the form of a circle equation. If I've got z squared minus 8z, that thing should look like z squared uh, minus 2 times r times e plus r squared. So completing the square on this thing, add in 8 over 2 squared is 16 plus 16. Uh, so this thing is x squared plus y squared plus z minus 4 squared, and it's equal to, it's equal to 16. Or 4 squared. All right, so in the end, this thing looks like a circle with a radius of 4, and a center at 0, 0, 4. Uh, and if we were to do something like asking you for the volume of this here shape, just as a total aside, uh, volume of a sphere, don't forget, is 4 thirds pi r cubed.
I'll say if I wanted the volume of the solid enclosed by the equation rho equals eight cosine phi, I could either do a triple integral of that thing, uh, or I could just use the volume of a sphere equation, uh, which is really relating things back to uh, that first bit that we did in, uh, in double integrals. Thinking about a double integral or thinking about a triple integral uh, as a geometric shape instead of as a, a thing that I actually have to integrate. But yeah, I can figure out what, I know what my radius is, it's four, because it's just gonna be half of whatever the coefficient on cosine was, or half of the coefficient on sine theta sine phi. Or if I wanted that to go in the x direction, I could be rho equals five cosine theta sine phi, uh, but I digress. Uh, a couple of the things that I think are worth looking over, just some concept stuff. Uh, out of section 15.2, we had Fubini's theorem. Uh, and one of them, an extension of that said uh, that if my function is separable, meaning my function f can be written as a function that depends only on x times another function that depends only on y, right? Think I can factor all my y's out of my x's. That's when I'm allowed to say that this is two separate integrals multiplied together. I used this idea quite a few times in the review earlier, uh, but this is the theorem that actually says I'm allowed to do it. Uh, but again, only when I'm multiplying stuff together, it's not if I'm at like, you can see in the pointing at my computer screen, like you can see that that's not how it works. Uh, based on the, the couple of things I wrote down up here, X times Y is good because I'm multiplying them together. If I'm adding X and Y together, that's, that's not good. If I want to use this separable function stuff, they have to be multiplied and not added. Um, what, uh, what else is next? Um, uh, so there was a quiz question a while back that was uh, concerned switching uh, the order of integration back when we're just looking at rectangles. Uh, and don't forget, you are allowed to switch the order of integration, but make sure that your bounds get switched as well. Uh, just you know, something to pay attention to on uh, maybe a true false question. Make sure that the bounds follow the switched order. Uh, and finally, uh, another formula that you should remember the average, what is it, the average value formula, uh, which says if I want to know the average value of a function f over some region. I should take the double integral over that region and divide by the area of the region. Uh, so again, formula that you might wanna know going into the exam. Um, 